This is Research Like a Pro, episode 133, The Doherty Case, part one. Welcome to Research Like a Pro, a genealogy podcast about taking your research to the next level, hosted by Nicole Dyer and Diana Elder, accredited genealogy professional. Diana and Nicole are the mother-daughter team at FamilyLocket.com and the creators of the Amazon best-selling book, Research Like a Pro, a Genealogist's Guide. I'm Nicole, co-host of the podcast. Join Diana and me as we discuss how to stay organized, make progress in our research, and solve difficult cases. Let's go. Hello and welcome today. I'm Nicole Dyer, co-host of Research Like a Pro, and I'm here with my mother, accredited genealogist Diana Elder. Hello. Hi, Nicole. How are you doing? I'm doing well, recovering from SLIG. I studied advanced methodology and loved it. How are you doing? Same. Just trying to catch up after a week of intense study on Missouri, which was fabulous. And I ordered one of the books that they recommended and started reading that yesterday. So I'm so excited. The title is A History of the Ozarks, Volume 1, The Old Ozarks. And the author is Brooks Blevins. And this is a trilogy and takes you all the way through the very beginning to current day. And I'm so excited because we have got a lot of family lines coming out of that region. It's the Ozark region is the northern Arkansas, southern Missouri area there. And that's where our Frazier family, the Briscoes, the Clantons, you know, that whole line. We've traced them right there to that area. So I'm kind of excited to learn the history really deeply and maybe get some more clues because they're kind of hard to trace. Records aren't super plentiful in that area. It sounds like your course on Missouri was really in-depth and really wonderful. Yeah, it was. And I'm going to be doing a few blog posts about that. We'll probably do some podcasts about some of the things that I discovered and learned because Missouri is the center of the Midwest and so many of our ancestors passed through there, whether they stayed very long or not. Lots and lots of families came through there on their way west and may have left some records. So I think it will be really interesting for all of our readers and listeners to learn more about Missouri's records. And they have fabulous repositories. I'm excited to to let everybody know about the great resources there for research. Oh, great. It was wonderful being at the Salt Lake Institute of Genealogy virtually, but I did miss being there in person with you. (laughs) I know that was fun last year when we got to stay at the hotel and participate in everything and see all of our friends and meet new friends. So maybe we'll get back to that in another year or two. I can't decide if it's easier to do the homework from the courses at home or when you're there in person, because I think I got distracted by doing home stuff and the homework for advanced methods was time consuming. I've heard that from other people who've taken it, that it's pretty intense. It was neat though. We learned a lot and it was fun to practice the things we were talking about during the day, but I should have blocked off more time to work on the homework and not just going about my usual activities afterward. Well, I saw online that some people who were doing slick from home, they just hold their families. I am in Utah this week. I am not here. And so they were just, they were just not being present in their home life, which, you know, if you can do that, but it's kind of hard if you have little ones to do that. (laughs) Well, today we are talking about a case study of mine from the Research Like a Pro study group last spring. And in this case study, I learned about Robert Doherty and his wife, Sarah Taylor, and their children. So the objective of the project was to find the children of this couple. So let me read the objective. Who were the children of Robert Doherty and Sarah Taylor? Robert Doherty signed a marriage bond on 18 November 1784 in Craven County, North Carolina, for his marriage to Sarah Taylor. Robert and Sarah were probably born about 1749 to 1769. And Robert died before November 8th, 1843, when he was listed as deceased in his estate appraisal. So I didn't have a lot of concrete, vital information for them when I started. I just had a marriage bond and an estate for Robert. So that's kind of what I used to estimate some of their birth 
information. I just gave like a 20 year range and I had deceased by 1843, but I don't know his exact death date. So I just kind of had this general objective of who were their children. Yeah, it sounds like you were just trying to figure out this family a little bit more. And I think a lot of times for our objectives, that's all we have to go on is one or two records. Sometimes we have projects where we have a lot of background information or background records. We've been researching them for years and years. But in this case, you really didn't. And so why were you picking the specific family? I'm just curious. <laughs> Well, I have been searching for the parents of John Robert Dyer for quite a while. He is our end-of-line Dyer ancestor. He was born about 1810 to 1813. We have a clue from oral family history that's been passed down that his mother's name was Sarah Taylor. Well, I never found any Sarah Taylors that were remotely connected to him in Hawkins County, Tennessee, where he lived from 1830 until his death in 1880. So I started looking at the DNA and why DNA did not have a super helpful clue. We started at 67 markers with the testing of my father-in-law and that showed a lot of matches with different surnames from Ireland. We bumped it up to 111 markers to see how close these people really were. And the first two closest matches were with the surname Kennedy and they're at a genetic distance of three and six. So for the first match, who's a genetic distance of three, if I click on the tip report for that in 111 markers, then it says that the probability that they share a common ancestor within the last four generations is 66%, and within the last eight generations, it's 95%, and within the last 12 generations, 99%. So I would say that's pretty close. Eight generations, though, is a lot further than we have traced. <laughs> so <laughs> we only have John Robert Dyer traced about four generations from Robert Dyer, my father-in-law. And so there's like four generations where they could be related and we're trying to find John Robert Dyer's father. So it's just kind of unclear. And then we upgraded to the big Y, 700. And my father-in-law created his own new branch on the tree. So he has no matches on the big Y. So my conclusion there was that either there are not enough dyers who have tested from this branch or that there is a break in the dyer surname line at some point and maybe there was a Kennedy. <laughs> so it's just kind of inconclusive from Y DNA until we can find some more people to test. Right. So then I looked at the autosomal DNA results of my father-in-law and his brothers who tested. And I was able to find the cluster for John Robert Dyer's descendants. And one of the clusters really closely connected to it, as I'm sure you know, because I've talked about this so many times, <laughs> was a cluster of matches who descend from a bunch of Doherty's and Taylor's from Craven County, North Carolina, who migrated together to Warren and Butler County in Kentucky. So the ones that had the highest centimorgans were descended from this Robert Doherty and Sarah Taylor couple. And as I mentioned, we had family tradition that John Robert Dyer's mother's name was Sarah Taylor. So when I saw this Sarah Taylor married to a Robert Doherty, I thought maybe this is his mother. So I added my father-in-law's Y-DNA results to the Doherty surname project, and they didn't match at all. There were no similarities, so I concluded Robert Doherty is not the father of John Robert Dyer. But then I wondered if this Sarah Taylor could have been the mother with a different father. So I wanted to investigate this couple to see if their timeline worked with that hypothesis. If maybe there was a separation, a divorce, or some kind of extra child listed on the census that there was no information about later, and just see who the heirs were in their family. Wow, that's a really great example of how to use your autosomal DNA to solve something. You know, you were able to focus on that cluster, figure out the common ancestors, and then hone in on researching them to make more discoveries. I think so many times we don't know what to do with our autosomal DNA that far back. And so 
this whole project is a great example of having to dig into the documents to try to make sense of the DNA. Right. Another complication from this Doherty Taylor extended family group is that they married each other frequently. So Robert Doherty and Sarah Taylor were first cousins and their siblings also married each other too, (laughs) which was crazy. So Sarah's brother married Robert's sister and they were all first cousins. So there's just a lot of DNA matches descending from all of these people and it's been tricky to sort out which ones to prioritize. So I focused on this couple first because some of the higher matches came from them, but they weren't that high, not high enough to conclude anything. I think they were sharing like in the 40s and 50s range of Cinnamorgans. Right. So there could be a lot of different relationships and it could even just be pointing to, of course, the parents of one of these people. Right. And like you say, with the pedigree collapse and people marrying first cousins and brothers and sisters marrying each other, there's a common ancestor there somewhere, but which one is it? <laughs> right. So I really needed to go to the documentary records to figure out what was going on with the family. So I started off by making that objective from kind of what I knew. And one thing I forgot to put in this objective was the place that Robert died his estate appraisal and all of his estate records from after he died were in Warren County, Kentucky. So he started off in Craven County, North Carolina. Then all the Doherty and Taylor families migrated to Warren and Butler counties, which are next to each other in Kentucky. So on my timeline, I had seen a lot of the family trees of the DNA matches. And then I used those to find the original records and the sources that the people were using. So I just took those records and put them in my timeline and kind of figured out what people thought Robert Doherty's timeline looked like. So the first record I had for him was a marriage bond that I mentioned in the objective. And it was from November 18th, 1784. And Robert Doherty signed a bond with bondsman James Taylor that he would marry Sarah Taylor. So of course, the first thing I noticed was that this bondsman had the same surname as his intended wife, Taylor. I figured they were probably related. And the family trees did show that there was a sibling of Sarah named James. So I wanted to get the original record. I was looking at an abstract that was attached to somebody's family tree So I figured there was probably a digitized microfilm. So I went to the county, Craven County in North Carolina at the Family Search Catalog and found their collection of the digitized marriage papers. And when I looked at those, I found a bunch of bonds. It was difficult to find the right one. The organization wasn't clear, you know, of the arrangement of these records. So when I finally found the one that looked right from November 18th, 1784, it was completely chopped off. The image was blurry and half of it was missing. And all that I could read from it was the bottom part that didn't even say the date. It just said that Sarah Taylor of the County of Four said, and then it had the legal use for the bond. And then at the bottom, it had the signatures of Robert Doherty, actually his mark, and the mark of James Taylor. So it didn't have the first part of the bond, but I could read what the first part of that bond said from the abstracts. So going to see the original in the county courthouse would have been ideal, but looking at the digitized microfilm of it online, you know, it usually is just as good. But in this case, it was not a good microfilming. <laughs> they just had kind of messed it up. And so in this case, for me, the more helpful record was the derivative. And that one had the date and just a little more detail. That is frustrating when you look at the microfilm and it's not what you had hoped. So that's a good example of using both the abstract and the original or what you can see of the original. But looking at this, it doesn't seem like looking at the original would give you much more information. These bonds were pretty sparse. It's not like they give you parents. In some states they did, but it doesn't seem like these North Carolina ones, or at least the set didn't give any information of parents. Agreed. That's why I didn't prioritize getting that because they had the abstract and I could read the other bonds around it and see that they didn't have anything else helpful at the very top. Right. It sounds like, and this one, the original, would not have given you much more information. 
So the book that had all the abstracts of the marriage bonds for Craven County was put together by Mary Jones Jeffries. And that was actually a very useful source because of the index. So I went to the index and I looked at other Doherty and Taylor marriages around that time in the same county. And I found a helpful one. It was the marriage of James Taylor, who you will remember it was the bondsman for Robert. And James Taylor was planning to marry Sarah Doherty. And the bondsman was Robert Doherty. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> most of the same people here. Yeah. So it looks like Robert had a sister named Sarah Doherty, Doherty possibly, who married James Taylor. And they were all cousins and they were bondsmen <laughs> for each other. And they got married first. They got married in January of 1784. That's so interesting. So basically, you're going to have two Sarah Taylors, one that was her maiden name and one was her married name. That's not confusing at all, is it? (laughs) Yeah, they're both connected to the Doherty family. So (laughs) yeah, yes. So this was interesting. So my next project will be to focus on that couple, James Taylor and Sarah Doherty, find out what happened to them. But like I said, the DNA matches were stronger coming from Robert Doherty and Sarah Taylor's family. So I started with them. So after looking at those marriage bonds, I put those in my timeline and I looked at census records that were attached in the family trees of the DNA matches. And there was a 1790 Craven County, North Carolina census showing Robert Doherty spelled D-O-H-E-R-T-Y. And there were so many spellings of this name. I bet. The spelling that I usually use is D-A-U-G-H-E-R-T-Y, but you can also find it without the R, so just Doherty, or Doty, and then you can find it Doherty, and with an H, without an H, with an O, with an A-U, so there's a lot of different ones. There's O-U-G-H, Doherty, without an R, so a lot of spelling options here. So I found the 1790 census with Robert, and then one of his neighbors was Daniel Doherty, and Daniel was shown in family trees as Robert's brother. So I noticed that. So then the next thing in my timeline was a deed in 1793, Robert Doty, D-A-U-G-H-T-Y, to Thomas A. Green, and he was selling some land in Craven County. Then I added in the timeline some of the children that were put in the family trees to be Robert's children. I put them in the timeline when they were born based on some of the census records attached to them in the trees. So one of those supposed daughters was named Mary Doherty and she married Jacob Roman supposedly. And so the 1850 census, you know, had her being born about 1796 in North Carolina. So I put that in my timeline. So that kind of was helpful for figuring out when the migration to Kentucky happened. And then the next thing on the timeline was an 1803 marriage bond, but it wasn't a marriage. It was a bond that Robert Doherty could perform marriages. So I thought that was interesting. So this was the first record I found attached to the family trees in Warren County, Kentucky. And it was just saying that he was able to perform, celebrate, and solemnize marriages in the county of Warren, and he is in regular communion in the church to which he belongs. So I thought that was interesting. I studied that bond looking for any clues about which religion that was and didn't really come up with an answer. So I would have to do a little more research on that. So interesting. That is in a collection called Kentucky County Marriages, but it's not a marriage for him. That's really an interesting record. And I think sometimes on the frontier, who knows what religion they were. They could have changed religions. If there's just one church out there, they all go to the same church. (laughs) You know, not every denomination was represented immediately upon a new settlement. So hard to know. This was another record where the spelling of his name was unique. This one was D-O-H-E-R-T-I-E, Doherty. Yeah. (laughs) Well, that's what it sounds like. And I think that gives you a good clue about how to say it, the D-A-U-G-H-E-R-T-Y, you know, because obviously they're pronouncing this more like it sound, sounds Doherty. Yes. Do you think this was Irish? This Are these original Scotch-Irish people maybe? Yeah. That's what it sounds like, the Doherty. Uh-huh. Yeah. So after Robert had that bond to perform marriages, there were a lot of records with his name on it where he's performing marriages. And some of those are marriages of his daughters. So the next record on my timeline was the 1808 marriage bond of John Beasley and Robert Doherty, 
for the marriage intended between John Beasley and Sina Doherty. Sina, spelled S-I-N-A. So some people had extrapolated her birth year as 1786 from this marriage bond because no permission was given. So it was assumed she was over 21 years old. And I think people just put in the year of 1786 for her birth. So I didn't really know for sure how to analyze that. I put that in my research plan to do a little research on the law and figure out what that meant. But I did notice that some people had put that. Hmm. Interesting. And then just a few months later in 1808, still in Warren County, another daughter was married, Betsy. And on Sina's record, it didn't say that Robert was her father. It just had him listed as one of the bondsmen. And then for this marriage of Betsy in 1808, this one was not a bond. This one was an actual image where it has a list of all of the marriages performed by Robert Doherty, and it lists out the marriage of Betsy Doherty to Philip Roman in Warren County, Kentucky, September 15th, 1808, and it says the marriage was solemnized by Doherty. Hmm. And then there's a request for a license also with this record that says Betsy is the daughter of Robert Doherty. So this record actually stated that Betsy was Robert's daughter. But some of the other ones didn't really say, but people had inferred. And then next I had the 1810 census of Warren County, Kentucky. And I found Robert Doherty on there, spelled D-O-H-A-R-T-Y. And none of the neighbors were recognizable, but I did list their names in my timeline just in case. The next thing on the timeline is the marriage of Mary Doherty in 1811 and the bond between Jacob Roman and the state of Kentucky mentioned that Jacob Roman was over 21 years of age and Mary Doherty, the daughter of Robert Doherty, whose consent was this day acknowledged, were planning to be married. And so some people had put that Mary was born in 1796. So if that was the case, she would have been about 15 or 16 when they got married. So that makes sense that the consent of the father was required. And if you'll remember, we had the 1850 census of Mary Romans. And it did put her birth year in 1796, so age 15 at marriage. And this record was great because it also said that Robert was the person providing consent. And so we can infer that he was the father. Right. And I just want to mention that these are interesting records when you look at them on the microfilm they've been pieced together. So the image shows on this one, six little pieces of paper that have all been placed together and then filmed all at once. And so these kind of marriage bonds out of Kentucky are really fun to look at. And some of them are typed and some of them are handwritten. So you can tell they were just loose papers sitting in some file that when they microfilmed them, they put them all on the table and took the picture. So Kind of fun just to look at the film. Yes. And, you know, Warren County supposedly experienced a courthouse fire. And if you look at the edges of these papers, some of them are kind of dark. I wonder if they were slightly singed. (laughs) It makes you wonder. And it's so fun because out of one little piece of paper like this, you can get so much evidence. And, you know, just one little piece of paper with all these words on it can help us to make connections with relationships and people. Absolutely. And I really had to dig into that when I wrote the report and add in the laws and things about the marriage ages and consent so that I could infer and make connections about their age and things like that. All right. The next thing on the timeline was the 1820 federal census in Warren County and Robert Doherty was listed. His neighbors included many people in his fan club that I recognized, including his wife's father, Moses Taylor, James Taylor, William Taylor, James Romans, Peter Romans, Philip Romans, who was his son-in-law, Jacob Romans, and some other people in his fan club. Okay, so those people were not there on the earlier census, or maybe they were, but they just didn't show up as his neighbors in 1810. So it makes you wonder if he was one of the first settlers, if he went over and then wrote back to them and said, come to Warren County, this is a great place to live. And then they eventually made their way because that's how the migration happened. You know, somebody went on ahead and then others continued to come. 
Yeah, it's possible. And I haven't looked up a lot of them in the 1810 census, so I would need to do that. But there was a family story that they all came together in a big troop, but it's possible some came later. Or maybe they came together, but they were not all living next to each other. Or maybe the order of that census was just taken not by household. It's just whoever came in at a certain time to be listed. I mean, we don't know how those people are listed, but you could certainly look in the county and see if they were living there. That's a good question to ask. Who was there first? Well, there's only a few records left for this family that I had at the beginning of the project. There was an 1829 witness of Peter Doherty, who was assumed to be a son of Robert. He just witnessed a consent that Ann Berger could get married, and Ann's mother was writing that. It was also witnessed by Fornafor Taylor, and I'm not sure if I was reading that name right. Is Fornafor a name? Say that one more time. (laughs) Fornafor. Well, if it is, one I haven't heard of before. <laughs> right. So I think I saw it again. This time it was spelled with an A, for na for, but then I found it again with an I, for ni for. So I think that was the name, but it's a weird one. <laughs> I didn't find a marriage of Peter, just that he witnessed somebody else's consent. And then the 1830 census, Robert Doherty was still in Warren County, Kentucky. And I recognized all of his neighbors as Moses Taylor, James Taylor, Emily Taylor, James Romans, Moses Taylor Sr. So there were a lot of people living right there. And then in 1840, which was quite a few years after all of his other daughters got married, I found that there was an Anna Doherty who got married. And so Anna Doherty married John Manning. And there was no evidence that this was Robert Doherty's daughter, but she was attached to him in the family search family tree. So I put it in my timeline. She would have been age 36. Were there other Doherty's that came over with Robert? Is he the only Doherty there in Warren County? There was a Daniel Doherty, but I think he might have been in Butler County because they spread out between those two counties. Well, and you also have to wonder if she was a widow, you know, at that age. Yeah. And when I gathered more data in the research phase, I found a lot more marriages. So it was really tricky trying to figure Uh, out who everyone was. Yeah. Yeah. This was just one that was already in the family tree. So I was kind of, my starting point really was the family trees on family search and of the DNA matches for this family and just what other people had gathered. So I just took these records that were attached to the tree and put them in my timeline just to see what I could find for a starting point. So the next thing was the 1840 census for Robert Doherty, spelled D-O-R-I-T-Y. And then the 1843 estate record. So he died sometime between 1840 and 1843. I put a few different things in my timeline from this estate. I put the fact that he died before 1843 in October. And then also in November, they had a sale of the estate and various people bought things from it, like Peter Doherty and P. Romans, some various neighbors. And Peter Doherty was the administrator. And also I noticed some of the interesting things that were in his inventory, like a theological book, which fits when you think about the fact that he was authorized to perform marriages. Absolutely. And inventories can give you so many clues. And I learned so much about inventories at SLIG. We had an entire hour long course and had some homework on taking inventories from probate records and learning so much about the individual or the family from them. So yeah, good job finding that theological book. And also, I mean, they're pretty well off. You consider they're out in Kentucky and they've got so many things. Right. You know, one of the things I noticed is that they were also farmers. So in addition to being a reverend or whatever, he was farming the land. So they had a lot of farming implements. Yep. And the last thing I put in the timeline was a record for Peter Doherty in the Warren County Circuit Court records that mentions that he was the administrator of Robert Doherty, deceased, and he recovered a debt from merchants. That happened in 1844. And that's all I had for my starting point, which is actually quite a bit of good information, but a lot of it isn't tied together. It's just kind of put together by other people. So although these are original records, The authored records, the family trees are the ones that put them all into a family group. 
And so I felt my job was to gather all the rest of the data that maybe was missing and write it up in order to prove what this family group really looked like with indirect evidence and correlating all the information. Yeah, that was really good methodology. When you're starting with family you haven't been researching, that's a great idea to go out and just gather up what other people have put in their family trees and then put that in your timeline and analyze it because you learn so much and granted some of those might be incorrect relationships, but it gives you a starting point and it starts giving you a feel for the people and the place. So I think that's a really good strategy. Well, thanks. So the next step is to do locality research. And since I had not done previous research in Warren County, Kentucky before, I chose that county to study about and make a locality guide for. And I just focused on the time period before 1850 because that's when I thought I would find the most useful information. So I went to the Family Search Wiki and the Family Search Catalog, and I read and added some notes to my document for Warren County, Kentucky Locality Guide. I noticed that there was record loss in 1864 and that a county courthouse disaster destroyed most of the records. Now, that was a statement from the Family Search Wiki. But I've learned that most of the records being destroyed means different things to different people. So I checked in another guide, and that one said that only some of the records had been destroyed. So I just decided I would assume that most of them were still there and kind of do my own sleuthing in the Family Search catalog to figure out what was available. And I had already seen a lot of these marriage bonds and marriage books and court records that were attached to family trees. So I knew there was some stuff. Not everything was destroyed in the county. Yeah, that's really a good point that often we see something like courthouse destroyed or burned courthouse and we throw up our hands and give up. But we really shouldn't do that because there can be things that were saved, things on the state level. There's lots of ways to get around some courthouse loss. And you really have to dig deeper to figure out what's available. So I think it's exciting that you found so much on Family Search really was available for this era. Yeah, one thing I was hoping to learn more about during my locality research that I kind of came up empty on was, you know, more about church records from that time period because he was involved with his church and a reverend. And there just wasn't a lot. I did find a Kentucky Christian church directory that allowed you to search by city or town. I just didn't find a lot of good answers on that. I didn't spend enough time. So that would be something to do in the next phase. I did find that there were a lot of court records pre-1850 that I could look at. So I listed out all of those to think about when I was making my research plan. And they were all digitized on Family Search. And then land records, I saw that there were deed abstracts and the surveyor's book and various loose papers. So there were a lot of land records available. There was one entry for probate records in the catalog for the time period. And I found that there was a a list of tax records in Ancestry for this area. So that was a really useful tool as well, but it was only for 1800 to 1801. And then vital records, I found that there were a lot of marriage records. There weren't any birth or death in this time period, but there were marriages, which I had already kind of seen being used a lot. That's a good set of records. I love it when I see all of those, the court, the land, marriages, probate, and even a little bit of tax. I mean, those are your solid records for that time period. So that's kind of exciting, isn't it, when you see that many? Yes. Well, and I love to see that they're online too. Oh, yeah, of course. Digitized. Yes. I misspoke on the probate records. There were eight different categories of probate records, and I must have not finished my locality guide. But there were some bonds and equity judgments, and I put a lot of these into my court section. There were will books from 1821 to 1862, so even though there was a burned courthouse, they still had some of the wills. The probate records were from 1797 to 1985, and they even had loose papers and estate settlements from that time period, too. So I had already been kind of using some of those records in the timeline creation, so I knew they were there. Okay, well, it sounds like you've got a really good basis here for your research planning. Now you know what's available and you have a good background on the family. So next step, research planning. Absolutely. And I'll just mention that the locality research step 
doesn't have to only focus on just one county. It would be a good idea to focus on Craven County and Butler County and the state of Kentucky and U.S. federal records and just kind of think about all of those different jurisdictions that might be useful. This first phase of the research, I just wanted to focus on this one county and see what I could find there. But you could expand and and study the locality of many different places and plan to research in federal records as well. Yeah. And, you know, a different phase of the research could be an entire project just based on trying to figure out uh, Robert Doherty's religion and researching manuscript collections and, and seeing if you could find more information about his activities as a reverend or a preacher. But that could be a whole separate project, right? And then your locality guide would be on discovering repositories that could hold information. So there's so many ways you can go with this research now that you've done this little bit of background. So Mm -hmm. thanks for taking us through this project. You're welcome. And I was just thinking, you know, my locality guide was very basic. Um, I think sometimes in the study group, people are worried that they need to complete it and get it all done and make it exhaustive. But I just put in the things that I thought would help me answer my research question And I figured most of the children's records would be available in Warren County. And so I just wanted to focus on that. And I didn't want to make this a 100-hour project. So (laughs) with my limitations that I was putting on myself, I just decided to focus on this one area. But keeping in mind that I wasn't doing an exhaustive search, I was just doing one phase. Exactly. And if Robert Doherty was your confirmed ancestor, then you maybe would want to go seek out a lot more things. But because you're just working on this for a DNA connection. Of course, you just want to do the basics to start with. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to wrap this episode up for today and we'll talk to you guys again next week about the second half of the Doherty case and what I did for my research plan and my log, what I found and my report. So we'll talk to you guys again next week. All right. Bye-bye everyone. Bye. Thank you for listening. We hope that something you heard today will help you make progress in your research. If you want to learn more, purchase our book, Research Like a Pro, A Genealogist Guide on Amazon.com and other booksellers. You can also register for our Research Like a Pro online course or join our next study group. Learn more at FamilyLocket.com. To share your progress and ask questions, join our private Facebook group by sending us your book receipt or joining our e-course or study group. If you like what you heard and would like to support this podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review. We hope you'll start now to research like a pro.